Well, thank you, uh, Laura and, uh, and Karen, for inviting me to uh, share with uh, all of you out in uh, the internet, as well as uh, those of you here present at the Department of Commerce Library, um, some of the, um, I think, rather exciting things that, um, that I and my colleagues have been involved in, but also um, things which we were not necessarily involved in, but uh, will give you a flavor of uh, what's so exciting about magnetism specifically when one thinks about nano things or nanotechnology. Um, so since the uh, audience is so varied, um, I thought I would say first of all where I'm from. So I'm from this National Institute of Standards and Technology. Of course it used to be called the National Bureau of Standards. Um, and it's, this is what it looks like. Uh, it's out in Gaithersburg, Maryland, at least one of the, the, the larger facility. There's also another facility in Boulder, Colorado. I happen to be, of course, in the Gaithersburg, Maryland facility. But it's, uh, it's very close, as you can see, to uh, Washington, D.C. Um, in fact, uh, here's a Department of Commerce right around here, and you can get on the red line of the metro and go right out to Shady Grove at the end of the line, and then there's a free shuttle that goes from the Shady Grove stop right to and from uh, NIST. So it's very easy to, to, uh, to get to. Um, so that's, that's where I'm from. It's a measurement science laboratory, for those of you who don't know it. Um, it's, uh, it's a rather exciting place because there are so many experts in so many different areas that uh, if you want to know uh, the property of uh, some particular material or how it's measured, there's probably someone there who is a net real expert in measuring that property and uh, not just measuring it, but also measuring it on down to absolute uh, quantities traceable to fundamental units. So, uh, as I say, NIST is a, is a measurement science laboratory, and we also have uh, in, implicit in our new name of NIST this, uh, this uh, mission to transfer technology, especially, particularly to U.S. industry. So, a lot of the things I'm going to be t talking about this morning, uh, uh, we not just myself, but a number of people have been instrumental in getting this message out to the uh, U.S. community in particular to let them know about these exciting discoveries and to a certain extent how perhaps they might be able to utilize them in putting together various products. In the meantime, we're looking ahead at NIST to figure out if there are any standards which might uh, slow up the development of this technology and, uh, and subsequently trying to work ahead to, uh, to solve that problem before it becomes a major problem. So that's where I'm from. Um, it's, uh, I'm gonna be talking about magnetism, as I mentioned, and since the audience is so varied, I thought I should spend a few moments at the beginning of this talk to describe a little bit about magnetism, perhaps uh, some of which uh, a lot of you probably don't realize. So the first thing is, Magnetism is, is all around us. If you look at the periodic table, uh, you can see up here that at room temperature, there are only a few elements which are what we call ferromagnetic. This is what most people think of when they think about whether it's a material is magnetic or not. So these are materials of the type that you would uh, see uh, sticking to the wall or on your refrigerator uh, because they have a permanent magnetism uh, uh, in them and subsequently can have a magnetic field coming from them and can stick to other mag magnetizable materials. So as you can see, there are only few elements at room temperature which have this property, and they are this iron, cobalt, nickel, and then gadolinium. But in addition to ferromagnetism, there are lots of other types of magnetism. In fact, all materials are magnetic, in fact. So, some of them are anti-ferromagnetic at room temperature, and I show on the chart here uh, in green uh, uh, the one at room temperature that's anti-ferromagnetic, chromium. But in addition to that, at low temperatures, some of these other elements can become ferromagnetic, and a number of them are down in the 4D series, or the rare earth elements, uh, starting with gadolinium and going to uh, heavier uh, atomic numbers. But even still, you can see there are 
there are relatively few total number of materials possessing this, this property. Now, one can make all sorts of alloys, combining these elements with any of the other elements on here which are not circled with any, any type of board, special border, and, and they, many of them will also possess this property. But in most cases, in order for a material to be ferromagnetic, it's going to have to contain at least some of these elements uh, that you see. Now, in addition to ferromagnetism and anti-ferromagnetism, there are some other magnetic properties. One is called paramagnetic, and the other is called diamagnetic. So pretty much all those elements to the left of that uh, vertical red line uh, on the periodic table are paramagnetic. And pretty much all those to the right of that line are diamagnetic. Now, there are a few exceptions, and those I've gotten uh, bordered with this uh, pink border. Uh, but by and large, you can uh, draw a line straight down uh, from the, between nickel and uh, copper uh, and, and, and separate out the magnetic states at room temperature again of these other elements. Now, when I say a material is paramagnetic or diamagnetic or ferromagnetic, uh, what does this really mean? Well, it boils down to what does the magnetization of the material look like when you apply a magnetic field to it. So I have some diagrams shown here. So if you look at the, this top left um, curve for a ferromagnet, so this is the material which most people are, as I mentioned earlier, commonly refer to as a, a material which is magnetic. So first of all, you have plotted on here the magnetic field along the horizontal axis and magnetization on the vertical axis. As you apply a and zero for both of them is right here at the crossing point of these two lines. When you apply a, a, a magnetic field, a positive field to it, to the right, what happens is the magnetization, first of all, starts out as zero and it develops a rather sizable magnetization which then saturates to this value I show here called the saturation uh, magnetization. If you take the field off now, the magnetization follows this part of the loop and at zero field now you're left with a net magnetization, a positive magnetization. And so that's why I say uh, these materials are those which most people think of as being magnetic because they have a permanent magnetization to them uh, or a magnetic moment, it's also called. Now, if you look further, applying a negative field, then the magnetization will all of a sudden start to drop pretty quickly until you reach a point like here, this is called the coercive force, where now the magnetization direction changes from positive to now negative. So you can switch the magnetization value from a positive value to a negative value when you cross this point at some negative applied field called the coercivity. Then as you then continue applying a negative field, it will follow this trajectory, ultimately reaching a saturation value, which is the same value as the positive saturation you had earlier, but now has the opposite sign. Now then, we can just carry this even further. Now let's reduce the negative field, and you'll travel along this trajectory to you come to zero field, and now you're left with a, again, a, a remnant magnetization, but it's negative in value. And in fact, the value of it, negative, is the same as the value was when it was positive up here. So even with zero field applied, now you've still got a remaining magnetization in the sample or material, but it's now oppositely directed in comparison to the direction that the field was. And then now if you apply a positive field now, it then follows this trajectory and now switches from negative value to positive value back up to positive saturation. So this, is, this describes what we refer to as a magnetic hysteresis loop for this material. And all ferromagnets have a uh, characteristic like this there are differences from material to material. For instance, the value of this field where it, magnetization changes from one sign to the other may be either larger out to here or much, much smaller to the point where you may not even see it. 
But the other thing about this curve is it's symmetrical about this vertical axis through zero in general. There are a few exceptions I will point out later on where that's not the case. And that, uh, but in general, it's symmetrical on the right and left and also top and bottom. All right, so that describes the ferromagnet. Now, a paramagnet, shown obviously over here, starting out at zero magnetization, when it's been demagnetized, when you apply a positive field, it develops a positive magnetization, just like the ferromagnet does. But the point here is that the, the slope of this curve is relatively small in comparison to the slope, the curve, the initial curve, which I've not shown here, to develop a saturation magnetization in a ferromagnet. So the, the total magnetization is a weak magnetization. And so we call this kind of a, a weak uh, magnet uh, when it's a field applied. But notice, when you take the field off, so we reduce it down to zero, the magnetization goes back to zero. So there's no remaining magnetism or magnetization in this material when you take the field off. And it's symmetrical when you go, to, oops, sorry. Oops, wrong thing. Here we go. Okay, so let's go back to here. So it's symmetrical about the origin. So if you go to negative fields, you develop again a negative magnetization. So the same direction as the field, but it, uh, it again is a small value. And when you take the field off, it goes back to zero. So the, again, there's no remaining magnetization in the material when you take the field off. Quite unlike the ferromagnet, where when you take the field off, there's a remaining magnetization, either positive or negative, depending upon when you came from a positive field or from a negative field. Now there's a third type, as you see here, it's called diamagnet, diamagnetism. And here, again, it's, it's very much like the paramagnet. In the, in the sense that as you apply a, a, a positive field, you'll get develop a magnetization. The, pro, the difference is that the magnetization that's developed is actually a negative magnetization. So the, the slope of this line is, is negative as compared to positive for the paramagnet. But again, when you take the field off, it's left with no net magnetization on it. And similarly, if you go to negative fields, you get a positive magnetization, so it's opposite the direction of the field. And when you take that field off, then again, it goes to zero. Again, the, the value of the magnetization for fields applied in general is relatively small, on, with the exception of when the material is a superconductor. A superconductor, uh, most people recognize, is a property of a material, usually at low temperatures, where the material will conduct an electric current without any resistance to it. So you can put a big electric current through a wire that's superconducting and get no resistance. But there's another fundamental property of a superconductor, and that it is, it's highly magnetic, but it's highly diamagnetic. So it develops a very high negative magnetization when you apply a field. But it's, it's a very, very strong uh, magnetization, but it's negative. And in fact, you can see the, the loop for such a material. As you apply to positive field, you develop this negative magnetization. As you continue applying a, a, a positive field, sooner or later, it all of a sudden uh, uh, begins decreasing for what we call a type two superconductor where flux, magnetic flux now goes into the material, whereas originally for a type one, no flux is allowed into the material to begin with. And that's what gives its very high diamagnetic slope. And then, but again, it's hysteretic. As you then reduce the, uh, the, the field, it develops now a positive magnetization, and then subsequently uh, that decreases and switches when you go to negative fields. Again, uh, a hysteretic material. So I'm gonna be talking primarily about this type of material, the ferromagnet. So I mentioned magnetic materials or ferromagnetic materials are everywhere. As you can see from this list I put together, all these different 
things that we use and know about that are all around us, and all of them have magnets or ferromagnets in them. Now, we don't realize this because in your computer or in the uh, transformers uh, running these lights or uh, uh, the lights over here or the microphones, these magnets are very small and inside the uh, device. You don't see them, but they are fundamentally important to the operation of those devices. One that we all know about, whoops, are... Um, uh, uh, transformers and generators. We would not have electricity if it were not for generators, which is basically a moving a, a ferromagnet right by a coil of wire. That's basically what a generator is. It's, it's the magnetic field that comes or, uh, goes around this ferromagnet that threads through that coil, which then induces a, a potential electric voltage at the end of the uh, the two ends of that coil, and thereby an electric current through it. So that's how most of our energy is created, uh, certainly in the uh, at very beginning of time, that's uh, how it was first created, and most of our energy still is through hydroelectric power plants, uh, 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 nuclear power plants causing water to move and, and go through a, a generator. Every, all electronic devices have transformers. And all transformers have a permanent magnet in them. And I'll show you a little bit later the details of that and where nanotechnology uh, has a big impact on these sort of things. Um, so your cellular, cellular phones, obviously credit cards, the memory in your computer, uh, pretty much everything. So our, our way of life would not exist the way it is now and as, as uh, well as it is if it were not for uh, these ferromagnets. So they are very important ma materials and they're all over the place. But one thing I want to stress, as you can see down the bottom right in, the, uh, in this box, that the magnetic character or characteristics of that ferromagnet will be different depending upon what sort of application that magnet is being put into and for what use it, it's made of. The, 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 the characteristic of, uh, of the ferromagnet that you would use for a transformer would be quite different from the characteristic of the ferromagnet that you would use in your, uh, on your hard disk for a recording is a good example. And so one of the things we do at NIST is in fact figure out how to properly measure these sorts of materials, especially for different applications. Here in, in a, a present-day car, not the electric car. The electric car is even worse in terms of the amount of magnets in them. But you can see all the things in, in the automobile which are, require a magnet in it. In fact, the total weight of magnets in the car is a, a significant uh, uh, number. And, um, uh, and basically anything that moves in your car any type of motion device, your electric windows, your windshield wiper, whatever, they all have uh, your seats uh, moving around, they all have magnets in the sensors and the motion uh, devices. So, as I say, they're all around you. So this is the characteristic of the ferromagnet, this hysteresis loop, as I showed you before, and knowing whether the loop looks like this or perhaps like this, which could equally well be the case, or it could even look like this, where it's now shifted. So it's no longer symmetric about this vertical axis. All these are characteristics. Also the height, I didn't show this, the height of this may vary. Okay, so that the, some of the ferromagnets have a much, much higher saturation magnetization than others. Um, so all these are, uh, characteristics are fundamentally, uh, need to be known in order to know how it's gonna be properly used. All right, so after this digression of, uh, of teaching you about magnetism, uh, let us get into more of the heart of this uh, talk that uh, I'm giving, which will talk about nanotechnology, essentially. So I'm going to start out by giving you some idea of why one might think properties might change in a material if you reduce some sort of material dimension in that material. Some sort of critical dimension in that material, if it's reduced to the nanometer 
size, um, this will give you some idea of why you might expect things to change. So, uh, and then I'm going to go through a number of different application areas where having reduced some characteristic in the material um, uh, gives rise to something novel or new and very useful. And um, I'm not going to go through all of these because I don't think I have the time. And then I'll draw some uh, summarizing uh, statements. So this is not going to be an all-inclusive talk because that's not possible in the allotted time. Uh, but I will give you a flavor uh, of um, uh, what is happening or has been going on in this uh, arena for the last, I guess now, uh, 20 years, ever since, um, well, well before the National Nanotechnology Initiative. In fact, it was one of, because of some of these characteristic changes that I got interested in getting together with a number of other government agency uh, individuals to help put together this committee that subsequently wrote the National Nanotechnology Initiative that uh, I'm sure many of you know uh, uh, much more about than I do even at this point. All right, so there are three basic reasons why things might change, okay, when you reduce some material dimension. The first one is shown by this, uh, this schematic. So, and that is, uh, I refer to quantization. If you have some sort of particle or entity, and that particle could be a, phot a photon, it could be an electron, it could be a phonon, it could be a magnon, it could be all sorts of things. But if it is contained, or constrained rather, to stay within a certain region in space, like in the material, if it's constrained to stay within a certain area, maybe between two different atoms that happen to reside in the material, or whatever, if it's constrained in space, then the energy levels of that thing are quantized. That means that they are, it's not a continuous variation of energy of that particle uh, from zero up to whatever, but it's quantized in certain uh, values. So I, and the, and it's, uh, you usually can describe these, these things by a, a wave function. And so I show you the first two such wave functions, the lowest energy state shown by E0 and the next one E1 and the subsequent others. But the point is that the, it, the energies between these different states is, uh, are different from each other and, and the, uh, the spacing, that is the difference in energy at any particular uh, value of this L, uh, depend on, on L. And in fact, it depends, the energy level differences to, for each uh, level, n being 0, 1, 2, 3, et cetera, describing each energy level, um, go as the square of that number, but times some constant, and uh, inversely to the square of the dimension of this region in which it's constrained. So what this means is, when L is very large, like micrometers or inches or meters or miles, whatever, when L is large, small differences in L are not reflected by much of a change in the energy level uh, value and therefore the spacing between levels. But when L, oops, when L gets very small, then small changes in L re are reflected by huge changes in the value of this energy of each of these levels. So that means any property that depends upon the, the value of these energy levels, and there are lots of properties, uh, optical properties, uh, uh, audio properties, um, magnetic properties, etc. Any property that depends upon the value of the E sub n or the spacing between them will change quite drastically when L gets to be very, very small. So when L basically gets down into the nanometer regime, then you begin to see big changes in these properties. The second reason why you might expect big changes when you reduce some material dimension is shown by this uh, schematic. This schematic shows the, the structure, the crystal structure, of what we call a polycrystalline material. Most materials come as a combination 
of a whole bunch of single crystals all put together in various orientations. So the single crystals are shown by the positions of these atoms, all in a nice arrangement, okay, which is, is constant throughout this single crystal. And then we have another single crystal here. Gives, again, nice arrangement of the atoms in their uh, prescribed uh, locations, but oriented differently than this one. And this is similarly another one. Again, oriented differently than either of these other two, and similarly others shown by these black circles showing the atom or atomic arrangement of these single crystals. And they're all put together at random orientations. So that describes a nice polycrystalline material, the, uh, the form in which most materials exist, uh, whether it's this, uh, this uh, table that the microphone's on or the computer or the chair you're sitting on, this is typically the structure or microstructure of that material. In between each of those single crystals are these atoms shown in uh, uh, uncolored, as you can see from uh, the, the, uh, uh, this uh, mouse, all right? And these, these atoms do not have a nice symmetrical arrangement of other atoms around it. So you take a look in comparison to one of these atoms and decide one of these single crystals. The other atoms around it are in a nice periodic arrangement around it. But those at these boundaries do not have that nice periodic arrangement around them, any one of them. It's different. In fact, the arrangement around this atom will be different than the arrangement around, say, this atom here at the boundary or one of these others around here. So that means that the properties that maybe this atom inside the single crystal or these polycrystals has, the property that particular atom may have will probably be quite different than the property that the atom at one of these boundaries is gonna have. Just because of the local atomic environment is so different and the properties of atoms are uh, primarily dictated by the properties of the local atomic environment around them. So one might expect these atoms at these boundaries to have a different property than the, these atoms in the centers of these, what we call grains. So these single crystals, uh, typically we call grains uh, in, uh, in material science. And so now if the dimension of these grains, we call it D, if that's very large, then the proportion of atoms which are inside these crystals compared to the total number of atoms in the, the whole material is actually quite large. And the, therefore, the proportion of atoms at these boundaries compared to all the atoms in the whole material is quite small. But as this grain size, D, gets small, now the proportion of atoms at these boundaries starts getting large. And you can see it by this graph put together by Dick Siegel here a number of years ago where he, he calculates up the percentage of atoms at these, these boundaries or grain boundaries as a function of the dimension, the diameter, average diameter of these grains. Now this is a logarithmic plot, so this is 10 nanometers. That's 100 angstroms. Now he, he calculated two different lines depending upon whether you assume that the, the boundary region only encompassed 10 angstroms or, uh, or uh, five angstroms in this range. But you can see, like at, at way up here at 100 nanometers, so that's, um, uh, it's a thousand angstroms or uh, 0.1 micrometers. The percentage of atoms is around 2% of those in the boundaries. But when you come down to 10 nanometers, now it's around 20%. And you come even smaller down to say four uh, nanometers, that's 40 angstroms, now it's around uh, 30 to uh, 60%. You come down to say two nanometers, that's 20 angstroms, now we're talking between uh, 70 and 90% of the atoms are at these boundaries.
So again, if the property that you're interested in depends upon, uh, well, on the atoms at the boundaries will be, will be different than the property that atom will have inside. And so as you go to the nanometer regime, you can expect the properties to vary quite a bit from what they were when uh, the, there was no nanometer uh, di dimensionality. Now the third reason that you might expect some change when you reduce some critical material dimension down to the nanometer regime is shown by the fact that every property has some sort of critical length scale associated with it. And so I show some of these up here. You know, for resistivity, it's the mean free path. Similarly, for thermal conductivity, for strength, it's probably the dislocation Burgers factor. Uh, for diffraction, it's wavelength, et cetera. Uh, bond and chain length for elasticity, radius of curvature for boundary flow, magnetism, exchange length, et cetera. So every property has some sort of critical length scale associated with it. And, when, and many of these length scales are all in the nanometer regime. So when a material dimension gets reduced so it becomes comparable to one of these critical length scales, you can also expect that the properties and the variation of that property will change when, uh, from what they were at uh, much, much uh, larger lengths. So for magnetism, here are uh, uh, several such uh, critical uh, length scales that one might imagine. And I, this was put together by Michael Coey at uh, uh, University of Dublin. And I show the values in nanometers for a nice, what we call soft ferromagnet and a nice hard ferromagnet. And I'll describe what the difference of that is uh, in a little bit. And you'll see that th those critical length scales, by and large, are all in the nanometer regime. So again, uh, you can see that magnetism is no different than other properties like thermal conductivity, resistivity, et cetera, in the sense that when you get to the nanometer regime, then um, um, we um, uh, can expect big changes in properties. All right, so this has been a, uh, a description of why you might expect things to change. Now let's take a look at some things which have changed, this focused primarily on magnetism. Because up to now, what I've said applies equally well to magnetism as it does to any other property a material may possess. Thermal conductivity, uh, uh, its optical characteristics, uh, strengths, whatever, they all have the same general uh, features with uh, variation uh, down to the nanometer regime. All right, so what are some of these critical length scales which I'm talking about in the material? Well, I show uh, some pictures of some. It could be the, a particle size. If you have a very, very small particle, it could be the particle size. Or it could be this distance between the particles. If you, put, you could give some shapes to these particles if you want. And it could be the, uh, the, the dimensions here of either the, the long or the short axis. Um, it could be... Uh, you could make them into rods, for instance. And again, it could be the diameter of these rods, or it could be the, the separation of these rods. You could put a, make uh, materials which are, are composites, that they, um, they're not all one material, but a combination. So you might have one material uh, in the centers, and at the, the boundaries, you have some second uh, structure, or what we call phase, in a material, and it could be the thickness of this phase, or it could be the separation distances between the second phase. Uh, this would be akin to the, the grain diameter I talked before. Or it could be layered, could, and it could be the, the dimensions of the layer, how th uh, the th thin they are, or how thick they are. It could be the separation distance between these layers. So it could be any or all of these types of material dimensions which can now be controllably prepared and, um, and utilized. Um, uh, and when one of these sort of material dimensions is reduced to the nanometer regime, then you'll expect differences. All right, so one of the things that comes out that was uh, noticed uh, early on is that you could create new types of magnetism. I showed you four different types of magnetism early on. 
paramagnetism, uh, diamagnetism, ferromagnetism, and superconductivity. There are other types of magnetism, and one of them comes out uh, specifically because of reducing some dimension to the nanometer regime. And you can see that here. So this is what we call a phase diagram, where we just have a simple mixture of nanometer-sized things of two different species, species uh, labeled by large M and a species labeled by large N. And this is just simply a volume fraction of the, uh, the second species in the material. And then, and so one of these uh, species is ferromagnetic, the M species, and the one which is not ferromagnetic is labeled the N. And what one finds is if you look at the pure ferromagnetic material, then you have kind of what the, the uh, characteristics I showed uh, early in the talk, that nice uh, open hysteresis loop. But also, as you go up in temperature, typically a ferromagnet at some point changes precipitously from this ferromagnetic state to the paramagnetic state. This is what is known as the Curie point or Curie temperature of the material. So at that temperature, there's enough thermal energy available to break up the magnetic interactions between the atoms. So the material becomes now, the individual atoms are acting independently, uh, their magnetic moments are independent of each other, and it pr describes this state I just uh, mentioned before called paramagnetism. But what people found is that if you simply mixed nanometer diameter species of this with this non-magnetic material, then this Curie temperature dropped slightly, and still even today uh, controversial as to why it drops, because it really shouldn't in general. And then at some composition, I show it here at, um, oops, sorry, uh, about 60% of the non-ferromagnetic species, then it goes into forming a completely new magnetic state known as superparamagnetism. And I have a, so this is a, 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 a magnetic state that only exists if you have nanometer size ferromagnetic entities, but they are separated from each other. And that's what happens when you form this mixture is you end up separating these ferromagnetic species from each other, pulling them further apart so their magnetic interactions are diminished. So I have a little uh, demonstration of what this magnetic state is. Uh, before I show that, here's what the hysteresis loop for that material looks like. Again, it looks like a ferromagnet. That as you apply a large uh, positive field, you develop a nice positive ferromagnetization. But now, notice, when you take the field off, the magnetization goes back down to zero. So it's left with now no remaining magnetization, as a normal ferromagnet does, but it's gone to zero, and that's symmetrical for negative fields. So it's quite different from a ferromagnet, even though it can develop very large magnetization values, and this shape of this loop uh, looks very, very similar to that of a ferromagnet. All right, so here's a, a, a little demo I may put together to describe it. Okay, so here's my world, and what I'm gonna do is I'm going to populate this world with magnetic spins. And you can see these little magnetic spins as uh, these little compasses I'm putting on here. And as I put more and more of these uh, magnetic spins on there, uh, we'll begin to see uh, uh, the, uh, the appearance of this new state. Now, if there was no Earth's magnetic field when I'm putting these things down, the orientation of all these uh, little compass uh, needles would be randomly oriented. Um, and also, if there was no generator underneath the, um, or transformer, rather, underneath uh, this light box that I'm using to uh, to transmit it, it would be randomly oriented. Of course, they're not. So what we're going to do now is we're going to put these spins together in little groups or clusters, as you can see. So uh, we will do that. And what you're beginning to see is that these 
groups and clusters um, are oriented in the same direction, and every once in a while there's going to be one like this in here that doesn't act right, and you just take that one out of your system. And, and you're left now with this super paramagnetic state. And so you can see you form these clusters within which all the spins are aligned, but between the different clusters, the orientation of the spins is different. So basically, it's, it's, it's kind of like a paramagnetic material, but now, instead of having individual spins randomly oriented, now you have groups or clusters uh, randomly oriented. And so it looks kind of like this uh, picture here. So as I say, within a cr cluster, all the magnetic moments of each atom are oriented in one direction, and similarly in this one, and similarly in this one, and so on and so forth. But the direction of the net moment of this group or cluster is independent of the direction of net moment of this one or this one. And this describes this state called super paramagnetism. And this it will uh, be created, as I say, when you put in nanometer sized ferromagnetic entities in the, into uh, a system, but you separate them so they're not interacting uh, strongly with each other, or actually not interacting at all. Okay, so now one of the applications, and this will be, and even super paramagnetism plays a role in higher density storage uh, media, as you'll see, more as a problem than a solution. But let me show you what has happened in the last uh, 30 years in recording uh, media. So initially, we stored information as little particles or bits. I don't know if you all probably don't recognize this, uh, this ancient device. It's called a tape recorder. This is what I was raised uh, uh, with for recording information. And, and nothing has really changed from this early time to the hard disk now. You're still storing information with little magnetic regions. Initially it was particles. Now, it, it, in fact, it's still particles, but they're smaller. And the game was make those particles smaller and smaller. And if you made them smaller and smaller, then you, would, you could pack more of them into the same area and thereby give rise to a higher storage density. So the, the game was make the regions that you're storing magnetic information in smaller and smaller and then read that information. Well, and so uh, this is the more present media from uh, uh, this was from IBM here a number of years ago. And so basically, you stored information in these little particles. Some of them were magnetized to the left, others magnetized to the right. And this would become your one in binary encoding. This is your zero in binary encoding, or the opposite. Now around each of these regions that you've stored information, there's a magnetic field that's like a permanent magnet. And you have a magnetic field associated flux lines coming out one end, oops, coming out one end and going back into the south end. And so you have these flux lines coming out, and similarly from the neighboring one, you have flux lines, but they're going in the opposite direction. Now, if you moved, well, uh, so this was how you stored information uh, even up to today. But the point is that these little particles now are much, much smaller than they ever were back in the tape recorder days. Now what you do is you bring down a coil, like this, oops, I'll take that away. And this is basically your read head. So this is how you would read this information. So as this medium moved along this direction, say to the left, then these flux lines would thread through this coil, thereby inducing a potential in that coil that you could read. And if you moved, if it, uh, the magnetization was pointed to the left, and you move this thing to the left, it would induce a potential of one sign. And if the, uh, the, the flux lines, in fact, were like this here, and you move to the left, the flux lines are in the opposite direction, so you would induce the opposite potential in this coil. So that's how you could read the ones and zeros that you'd stored on your desk. Well, the problem now became, as you made these particles smaller and smaller, how do you read this? Because your coils are too large in comparison to the size of these 
regions that you're storing information in, so somehow you had to change your sensor. People have figured out how to make these, these particles in the regions smaller and smaller, but they needed now a new way of reading the information. And the coils were too big and insensitive. Well, luckily, about the same time that they came up against this barrier, then there was a dis um, And so uh, this is the information. Your, your one is a, uh, when it's ma magnetization is positive, it's your one, and when it's negative, it's a zero. Okay, so this is the, uh, is a function of time, a plot from, again, from IBM uh, Omaden uh, labs, showing the storage density, that is the aerial storage density in media as a function of year. And so we were moving up along this curve uh, in the re uh, time period where I was telling you. Okay, so now you get into the 1980s to 90s in that time range, range especially around uh, the end of 1980. There was luckily the discovery of a new effect called the giant magnetoresistance effect. And all of a sudden, this plot took a upward slope as you could now improve on the storage density because you now had a way of reading the smaller and smaller bits. Okay, so that's, this is the effect I mentioned. It was a discovery of this giant magnetoresistance effect. And basically, this effect is if you have two layers, a very... Th it's a thin film layered structure. If you had two layers shown on the left here, uh, in this case it was cobalt, where their magnetization is in opposite directions, and in between them you have a material which is not ferromagnetic, but is uh, paramagnetic or uh, whatever, like copper, then when you put an electric current through this, now uh, the, the electrons with one spin state would get scattered by the layer, by the atoms in the layer with a magnetization in the opposite direction to this electron, but not get scattered by this layer where the magnetization was in the same direction as that electron spin. So the, this electron would get scattered by this layer, not there. Similarly, this other uh, spin electron would not get scattered here, but would get scattered at this layer and on out. But if you then applied an external field to this system and switched one of the layer magnetization directions, say like this top one, so now you have a configuration like this, when you bring this one electron through with the opposite directed spin, it gets scattered both at this layer and by the atoms in this layer. But importantly, the electron with the opposite spin state, that is the same direction as the magnetization of these layers, it goes right through both layers unscattered. And so the electrical resistance to this electron is much, much lower going through this layer than this other electron in this case. And you could then calculate what the resistance for these two spin currents is and, and show that basically the re total resistance of this sort of configuration is much lower than the total resistance of this situation. And so you could plot the resistance change over the uh, original resistance as a function of magnetic field, both positive and negative, and you find that the electrical resistance can uh, be upwards to 80% or so in the original uh, data. Um, now, to put this in perspective, this is a huge what we call magnetoresistance. The maximum magnetoresistance up to this point of any material was about two and a half percent. And that was in an alloy of iron nickel called permalloy. And now you're, uh, here's an effect which has re uh, magnetoresistance changes on the order of 80 percent or even higher depending upon the temperature in the material. Well, people quickly realized uh, in fact, this was discovered by uh, uh, Albert Ferret in France and also by uh, Peter uh, Grunberg in uh, uh, Ulich, Germany, uh, simultaneously, and they received the Nobel Prize in 2007 for the discovery of this effect. People realized very quickly that you could um, 
use this effect as a sensor of magnetic fields. Since it, the resistance changes so quickly with small field changes, then you could use this as a sensor of those magnetic fields coming out of those little stored bits. Now, I want to point out, this effect relies upon having these very thin layers of ferromagnet material, and especially having a very thin layer in between. If the, the thickness of this layer, which was about one nanometer of the, the copper in between, if the thickness of this layer was uh, 1.2 nanometers, so 12 angstroms rather than 10, uh, you would not see the effect so much because the, the, uh, these two ferromagnetic layers of cobalt would be separated too much from each other, and once you switch one of the, uh, the, the directions of magnetization of one of these uh, layers, and you take the field off, it would switch right on back. There was nothing, nothing to hold it there. Now, if it were too th this copper in between was too thin, so like 0.8 nanometers or eight angstroms, it also wouldn't uh, work because now the coupling, the magnetic coupling between this layer and the bottom layer would be too strong. And when you switched with an external field one of these layers, you would also switch this one. And so you still were back in the same configuration you were before. It's just that both the directions would be in opposite. Uh, direction, but still the same, and you wouldn't see this magnetic resistance change. So it was critical in order to see this effect that, the, that one had the capability of preparing materials with this small dimensions and to do it controllably. And that is the case in the, uh, the develop in the 1980s, uh, people would be able to do that. And hence why uh, we were able to see this effect at that time and not really uh, much earlier. I just show for reference uh, the value of this magneto resistance chains that people were measuring around the world during that time is a function of the magnetic field, external field required to, you had to apply to get the, one of those layers to switch, direction of magnetization. And I just point out that you can get very large magneto resistance changes, but at the cost of requiring huge fields here on the order of uh, one Tesla. So that's a huge, that requires a, a, a very, very large uh, uh, magnet to create, and you're not gonna find those on electronic uh, circuit boards. So the operative region is from about 100 Ersteds or Gauss and less, and I just show values from our laboratory up at NIST, where in fact we led the world, primarily following my group, uh, Bill Egelhoff, led the world for about eight years and having uh, come up with uh, ways to make these, this layering where the re uh, uh, switching occurred in reasonable fields. So this is the, the present day uh, hard disk and the sensor. So here's your hard disk where you're storing information now in local regions on a, a thin film. And this is your little electromagnet for uh, writing uh, information on these bits. And this red region is the read head, which is now just basically a very, very small resistor. And so it's small enough to be able to read these uh, regions. One of the other things that people notice when you m reduce things down to these nanometer uh, dimensions was that they developed a time dependence. That's not the case in materials when they have macroscopic dimensions. Um, I just show here that in a crystal, a single crystal, generally speaking, there's gonna be an easy direction of magnetization, that is where it's easier to magnetize than in other directions. But you can, there are typically several such directions that are equivalent in a crystal, and so the magnetization can switch from one to the other direction, and there's a little energy barrier you've got to have to get over. Well, if you provide thermal energy to the system, you can allow, uh, sooner or later, provide enough thermal energy that you can switch from this one state where they're aligned this direction to this second state where they're, say, aligned in a different direction, and if you retain your magnetization in this direction, you've lost it when it switches. And so uh, I just show a little bit about uh, how this happens. As, 
the, the value of this energy barrier v depends upon the volume of this ferromagnetic uh, entity as well as uh, its, uh, uh, its general anisotropy. And um, as the volume gets smaller and smaller, this energy barrier gets smaller and smaller, and one can switch from one state to the other. Now, this would be very bad if you were to use this material for storing information on a hard disk, because if you store magnetization in one direction, then you don't want it to change its direction. And if it starts changing because you made things so small, uh, that's a problem, and so that's called the superparamagnetic limit, and that's what the recording industry is working on now to try to overcome, come up with tricks. One thing is to increase what is called the magnetocrystalline anisotropy in the material. That's where the direction of easy magnetization direction is coupled very strongly to the crystal lattice, and if you can increase that by a large amount, you can then reduce the size of the region, the ferromagnet. So that's one of the, the games they're playing. And I'll just show you. Uh, uh, in a ferromagnet, materials want to form in, uh, in small domains wherein all the spins are magnetized in one direction. In another region, they're all magnetized in the same direction, but it's different than this one. And I can just show you here for a, t a growth of this small domain with time that we measured in our lab. In a, in a cobalt, ruthenium cobalt uh, uh, trilayer. Okay, so let me move on uh, to some other uh, characteristics. So here's a transformer. This, is, as I mentioned, is in all electronic devices, and it's used to switch the, the voltage from what you get out of the outlets uh, in the wall to the voltage needed to drive that uh, device. And most of them don't need 115 volts in the U.S., of course, this is an alternating current, and you get an alternating current coming out, so most devices need much, much smaller voltages. So they'll have a transformer, and it's comprised of this a coil of wire from your input uh, current from the wall, and then going through that is a ferromagnet, shown in this big black region. This is called the transformer core. It's a ferromagnet. So what happens, when this, since this is an alternating current, it's switching its direction of current both to the right and to the left. And in the U.S., is 60 times a second. What that does, each time it, uh, it's in one direction, it's going, the current's going around a coil, it creates a magnetic field in one direction. Say, say uh, as I show from this diagram, it creates a magnetic field going down. But when now uh, a 60th of a second later, it switches the current in the other direction, and now the magnetic field is up. So it's switching the magnetic field up and down, up and down, up and down, 60 times a second. That magnetic flux that then gets contained in this core is carried in this ferromagnetic core over to this other coil, and it's switching direction of magnetization in this core 60 times a second, up and down, and that induces a potential in the secondary coil, which then creates an alternating current here, but it'll be a different voltage value depending upon the number of turns in this coil compared to the number of turns in this one. So that's how a transformer works. But look at the hysteresis loop for this transformer core, this black. So, you, uh, so the, trans the hysteresis loop of magnetization versus field looks like this. When you, the cost in energy to reverse the field and go back again is, is the area enclosed in that loop. So that whole area enclosed is the energy required to, uh, to make one cycle of magnetic field of this uh, ferromagnet. That goes into creating heat. That heat then will heat up this transformer core and you can either then heat it up to the point where it comes to its curie point and then it ceases to be a ferromagnet, becomes a paramagnet as I showed earlier, and it no longer works, or you heat it up to the point where this material, the core melts, in which case it destroys the transformer. So you have to pull that heat out of here. If you're going around here 60 times a second, you're getting this amount of heat created each, each cycle, so 60 times this. And so, Anything you can do to reduce this area enclosed in the hysteresis loop of this ferromagnet that's used in the core is beneficial because it will save huge amount of energy that you don't need to subsequently pull out by cooling it. 
All right, so the normal way to reverse the magnetization from up to down is shown by this. So first of all, you start out with, at high field with a magnetization all in one direction, and we call this a single magnetic domain. Now, as we then reduce the field, then the, uh, we'll come to here, and what will happen at this point where it just begins to rever uh, reduce its magnetization, is it some negative field, you create a local region shown here where the magnetization is reversed. This is called a second uh, domain with reverse magnetization. And as we then apply a little bit greater negative field, the magnetization drops like this. And all that happens is that wall has moved along through the material until finally, over here, you're left now with that wall having been completely annihilated and you're left with the magnetization completely to the left. This is the easiest way to reverse the magnetization in a ferromagnet. So it's because you only need to reverse the spins at this wall. You don't need to reverse all the spins at the same time in here. All you do is reverse the spins at the wall, and that allows the wall to continue to move to the left. It's kind of like trying to move a rug. If you try pulling on the rug on the floor, it's very hard to move it. But you can move it by creating a big ripple in that rug and letting that ripple run down the, uh, the room. And there are only this little segment which is in that little hump is moving at any one time and it's easier to move that way. So this is similar. Now, reversing back, then the magnetization basically does the same thing. Notice that the region where you create this reverse magnetization domain is this, was the same as it was when you were coming along this side of the loop. And that's because for a normal ferromagnet, it doesn't care whether the magnetization is either to the right or to the left. The region where it first nucleates this reverse domain are regions where the energy barrier to creating that is smaller. That's typically a defects near the uh, sample edges. Okay, and then it uh, follows up to finishing it. That's the easiest way to reverse. Well, very effective things at keeping that wall from moving through that material, that domain wall, are grain boundaries. So back to this picture, so these boundary regions between these single crystals, these grain boundaries, these are very effective places to keep a magnetic domain wall from moving through it. And it's primarily because the orientation of this single crystal here is different than here. And when it's, uh, it's moving in this direction, all of a sudden it hits this boundary and it, and it re probably requires a different energy to continue moving into this crystal. So that means that as you reduce grain size, shown by this plot, then the coercivity, that is the width of the hysteresis loop, which then would mean if you reduce the width of the hysteresis loop, that area, that red area I showed you earlier would be smaller, you notice that it goes in the wrong direction. If you reduce the si grain size of the material, your coercivity gets larger. In other words, it, you expend more energy. So if 30 years ago anybody had suggested making a very low coercivity material or a better transformer material by reducing its grain size, they probably would have been laughed out of the room because it goes in the wrong direction. But they didn't recognize that sooner or later, if the grain size became comparable to the width of that wall, that domain wall that's moving through the material, once the grain size is comparable to it, now that magnetic domain wall can move easier and easier from one grain into the other, and in fact, the coercivity begins dropping. In fact, you can get some of the lowest coercivity materials by making materials with nanometer-sized grains in it, or even amorphous. So one can make very, very, what we call soft ferromagnets. These are materials which then change their magnetization with an uh, external field very quickly. And so you can uh, reduce this area by reducing these crossing points. These are the coercivities. So you make this loop narrower and narrower. And so that's the direction that many of the uh, transformer companies are moving now is to make nanocrystalline material for that purpose. Um, how are we doing on time here? Okay, so we're still okay. All right. Now, look at the opposite type of materials, hard ferromagnets. These are the type of materials that make up these permanent magnets that you stick on the wall, et cetera. Um, uh, that, uh, now, one idea was if you coupled – 
a nice hard ferromagnet like samarium cobalt to a nice soft ferromagnet like iron that you, you may well come up with a material which has a much larger area enclosed in its hysteresis loop. For a nice, good, permanent magnet, you want that area enclosed in that hysteresis loop to be as large as possible. So it's, it's the opposite uh, requirement from a soft ferromagnet, which would be used in a transformer. Okay, the idea was that this so hard ferromagnet would magnetically pin the spins in the soft ferromagnet at the interface between them, making it harder for this soft ferromagnet to reverse its magnetization. That was the idea put forward by Neller and Hawig back in the early 90s. Nobody uh, had uh, proven such a thing. And the reason why people th thought more recently that, if you, that this might give you a better permanent magnet was most permanent magnets, right now the hard ferromagnets, have a nice saturation magnetization with a very large coercivity value, but the soft, best soft ferromagnets have a much higher saturation magnetization than these hard ones, but obviously have very low coercivity. So if you could take some of this hard ferromagnet out of the material and replace it with some of this soft ferromagnet, the total saturation magnetization is gonna be increased somewhere between this value and this value up here. And if the hard ferromagnet kept the soft ferromagnet from reversing its magnetization so quickly, then it would keep the coercivity of the composite very high. That would give rise to a larger area enclosed in the loop and therefore a better permanent magnet. That was the idea. And if you made these things nanometer size, then you increase the number of interfaces between them, thereby promoting the greatest exchange interaction between them and therefore by forcing the soft ferromagnet to switch at the same high course of fields that the hard ferromagnet is switching at. Okay, so this is the idea. Instead of reversing like I showed before, now they say the, 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 this uh, prediction to, dependent upon forcing the, uh, the soft ferromagnet to reverse its magnetization by rotating its spins rather than forming that one uh, a nucleus with a reverse magnetization to reverse. This is a much, much harder process than the nucleation and growth process. And this is why it would force the, the soft ferromagnet to reverse differently. When you come back, it would do basically the same thing. And so, in fact, the, one of the best permanent magnets, this neodymium iron boron magnet, is and when people look at it closer, is in fact this type of morphology. It's got this high, hard phase, which is separated by a magnetically soft phase between the grains of the other two. So the, the best paramagnets are of this type, although they were not intentionally made it that way because people didn't recognize the advantage of having this hard, soft exchange. Okay. Um, so we developed, in order to, to see if indeed this idea was correct, we developed a technique in our laboratory for imaging domains ferrom and ferromagnets. And it relied upon basically um, putting the a, a very thin film, this green film, on top of the sample that we're interested in imaging, this uh, reddish uh, material. And what we would, the, the film has a characteristic shown here, that it's magnetized in plane, but it also has a very large magneto-optic fa uh, Faraday effect. What that means is it rotates, when you bring a light beam from a polarizing microscope, so you polarize the light beam, bring down this polarized beam through that film, reflect it off the film back up through here, the polarization of that light beam will be rotated depending upon whether the magnetization uh, in the, this film is perpendicular or in plane. Now it's normally in plane, as I showed you here, but where there's a domain wall in the sample, then there'll be some magnetic flux lines coming out of the, the film, as we can see it here. So here's the sample, here's our film, 
Some of the flux lines from the, at a domain wall where the magnetization chain is from to the right to the, to the left. Some of the flux will come out here and go back in here and it will locally change the magnetization direction in this film on top of the sample perpendicular up here and down here and so it rotates the polarization vector of the light beam that comes through here differently here as compared to the adjacent regions. And so you basically can see lines, a dark line at one edge and a bright line at the other edge. The other thing is you can apply a magnetic field to the sample, basically moving these magnetic domains in the sample and you can watch these lines move in real time. For this particular sample I showed you, we pulled a trick. We actually drilled a hole through the sample in order to create, so we drilled a hole through the sample in order to create edges which would then reflect the direction of magnetization in the region around it. It would be dark on one side, bright on the other. And um, and so then we could tell the direction of magnetization when the magnetization was in plane and changing. So that's what we did here. And you can see that if we oriented the field in this, this bilayer of the samarium cobalt with uh, uh, iron on top, we've, if the, the field direction was slightly off the easy direction of magnetization of the material, say uh, clockwise, then you can see the bright in the dark, shown by this line from the brightest to the darkest point, rotated basically counterclockwise as you just increase the magnitude of the negative field. So we get reversal of the in-plane magnetization by rotation, not by the nucleation of some domains, which we don't see here in growing through the material. Similarly, if we oriented the field slightly off counterclockwise from the easy direction, you notice this bright and dark edge region rotates clockwise as you go from high field down to uh, greater uh, negative fields. So it just basically proves that the, the theory of Neller and Hawley is correct. Okay, and so in fact, uh, we showed that in fact you can make the, a material with a, hard, a larger area enclosed in the hysteresis loop by making layered structures with these sort of dimensions for the, um, uh, for the samarium cobalt as a function of the iron th uh, thicknesses, and we can in fact get an energy proc better than some of the best neodymium iron boron magnets. So that's one of the uh, regions, and it's basically because um, uh, we did not go by uh, nucleation and growth. Okay, so now we're looking at um, some material um, in fact, I think I'm going to skip over this because I see time's going by a little fast. Basically, this shows that the, what we found is very anomalous is there are some nucleation sites for nucleating a reverse domain which depend upon the direction of the field. So here, it's for the field pointing uh, uh, down, we created nuclei here which are not reproduced when we did the reverse experiment uh, applying the field up. But there are other ones, like this one here, which are not seen when we apply the field down. Uh, this is very anomalous, it does not occur unless you have very, very thin uh, materials, like in this case, a very thin cobalt or platinum. And, there, and the growth and uh, reduction rates are vary surprisingly. Okay, so I wanna go into quickly about mag magnetic uh, thermal effects. The magnetocaloric effect is simply the effect that comes about if you take a system of spins which are randomly oriented, say at temperature T naught, and you apply a magnetic field to it. And when you apply the field to it, you orient all these magnetic spins in one direction. This is a, uh, entropically, this is a low entropy state for the, the, the spin system because they're all ordered. Of course, entropy is a, is a measure of disorder in a material. But if you do this field application adiabatically, even though you've, that means the total entropy change has gotta be zero in the process. And if you reduce the spin entropy by applying the field, it's gonna be offset by an equal and opposite increase in lattice entropy. Or in other words, the creation of phonons, uh, 
or heating of the material. So that's why the temperature then goes up. Now, vice versa, if you take the field off this material, randomize the spins, now you're increasing the spin entropy. It's going to be offset by a decrease in lattice entropy or decrease in phonons. That means a decrease in heating, so it will cool. So it's a, it's a reversible process. You can go, you can heat the material by applying the field, and you can t cool it by taking the field off. And you can use this in a refrigerator to move heat from one heat reservoir, so we can move uh, uh, heat from one reservoir to another reservoir simply by heating up this material in a field, decoupling it from this reservoir, pulling it up to here, expending, uh, sucking in heat from uh, this reservoir, then decoupling it from here, pushing it back in the field, and uh, then expending the heat from the material into this other heat reservoir. And so I could go through this cycle uh, for you, but I think probably uh, you can do that on your own. Um, so um, you, you can, this is basically what a refrigerator is, uh, or a heat pump, depending upon which reservoir is the large one and which one's the small one. So in fact, you could think about making a magnetic refrigerator. So this is quite a change from refrigerator magnets to magnetic refrigerators, but using the same terms, of course. Okay, so why does one care? Well, one could care because, first of all, it's a reversible process. You can infinitely stop the application of the field on the material and reverse it. That's not the case of the competing technology of expanding and compressing a gas. You cannot infinitely stop the expansion of a gas and reverse it. That means that that technology is not a reversible process, which means that it cannot Theoretically, the, the magnetic process is much, much more efficient because it is reversible. In fact, it could achieve, in principle, Carnot efficiencies, which are the best you can do. The other thing is that the refrigerant and the heat transfer media are different, so you can get rid of these environmentally harmful CFCs. And the other thing is there's very low vibration. You don't have this compressor that's causing the hum and the vibration and things. So in principle, it could be uh, last a lot longer. But you need to m m work on the materials to get them bigger. We showed a number of years ago, theoretically, that if you put materials together in these clusters, like in this super paramagnetic state I showed earlier, then you could get a higher entropy change, so this measures the entropy change for a one Tesla field change as a function of temperature of the material. And for when we have individual magnetic spins, and then we group them into 10 atom clusters, 30 atom clusters, and 100 atom clusters, and you can see that, say compare this red curve to the blue curve, so the 30 atom cluster to the blue, you can see that at one point, these two curves cross, and you actually get more entropy coming out of using single atom materials in the cluster. But the point is that at the, in this regime, this requires uh, magnetic fields uh, much higher than you would uh, be put into a magnetic refrigerator. So this is not a regime you need to worry about. But for all temperatures higher than that, having it in clusters gives you a much higher entropy change for the one Tesla field change than individual spins. So, in fact, in the super paramagnetic state, we showed you could get a big enhancement of the magnetocaloric effect. We subsequently showed that with a material of gadolinium gallium garnet, where we add a little bit of iron to the material. Oops. The idea was the iron having a magnetic spin would couple the independent moments of the gadolinium, which are in black, getting them to now cooperate and, and form this magnetic cluster which would be different in direction than another. So that was the idea. It worked. This is without any iron. It's a nice paramagnetic material shown by the fact you have nice linear magnetization versus field isotherms. When you put a little bit of iron into it, those isotherms turn nice and curved, which showed that it's now is super paramagnetic. And this shows you the data that we measured. Uh, this is a delta S for one Tesla field change for materials with different amounts of iron added. And you can see that indeed, you do increase the entropy change 
uh, as you form the superparamagnetic state. And I just like to point out, we do in fact have a, a patent uh, from uh, another Department of Commerce uh, agency uh, on this. And in fact, uh, to show you that this is all the entropy you need to, uh, to have an operating refrigerator and we can exceed this value uh, at, uh, for permanent magnets uh, for up to much, much higher temperatures than previously possible by using this technology. And so, uh, and you don't need to worry about hysteretic effects. Okay, so I'm just gonna end on the fact that you can also use the spin on electron rather than the charge for creating devices. All present day devices are based on the fact the electron has a charge. And you're putting different materials next to each other with different charge density of states. You can do the same thing using the spin of the electron. And that's the, uh, the origin of this whole area called spintronics. You could think about making spin transistors. Um, and you could, uh, and one of the big things now is to be able to use an electric current to go through a material like this GMR type material and switch the magnetization from up to down and, and up and back to down uh, using the torque on the current uh, as a way to switch it. That's a much, much more localized way of doing it and a much, much faster way. So there's a lot of work going on in this direction, including in our lab and elsewhere. Again, the size of these regions, junctions, have to be very, very small. So again, this is only possible in this whole nano uh, uh, period. Also to control anisotropy. The magnetic anisotropy is, is important. For all these ap applications, I just showed some data for a cobalt platinum system. We're putting in a thin film of platinum in the, in the material. As we change the thickness of that, of course, platinum does not have a permanent magnetic moment. Only the cobalt does. And all we're doing is changing the platinum and changing the relative uh, interface here. We can change it from in-plane magnetized to perpendicularly magnetized just by changing platinum. This is another big direction of research. And uh, uh, so I think I'm gonna stop there. Uh, and uh, thank you all for, uh, with these uh, summarizing statements uh, for uh, staying with me. Thank you. Thank you, um, and I know we have... I know we have quite a few questions from the WebEx crowd, and I don't know if there are questions in the audience here. Maybe as we'll start with someone in the room. Anyone yet? All right, I'll let you guys formulate. Um, one of the WebEx people, Denwood, had asked, uh, will we ever have the capacity to augment the geomagnetic field, perhaps using nanoscale devices? The intent is to protect the host, the Earth, from cataclysmic solar events, EMP, et cetera. This is a little bit out of my field. <laughs> That's okay. Um, I, I guess I, I should really profess I don't know. That's um, fair enough. Fair enough. I, I, I must admit, when um, you know, when I think about it, it um, it seems like it would be a very formidable task, uh, even using nano uh, magnetic things right now to do that. Great. Well, we'll move on to another one. Um, and this one may also be a little bit outside of your wheelhouse, and that's okay. Uh, will we be able to augment human senses with electroreceptors, like with sharks, uh, and magnetoreceptors, like worms have? Well, that's, that's conceivable. Again, we're getting out of my area of uh, knowledge uh, uh, of the um, uh, behavioral uh, science of sharks and, and uh, people, but certainly magnetic devices are getting smaller and smaller now as a consequence of much of the development in the ability to controllably make things at these nanometer thicknesses. And they have, as you're already seeing, some very unusual and uh, uh, useful uh, characteristics. So uh, it's, it's, it's a very easy leap to go from sensing to using it to actuate mm -hmm. uh, effects. So it's, it's conceivable that you could use these devices to actually create fields that uh, may affect uh, animals. Certainly people have found that in birds, that they uh, know which way to fly by these, this magnetotactic bacteria that's in their brain. Mm -hmm. These are very, very f small nanometer sized particles of magnetite, that's Fe304, which are lined up and they will give a directionality uh, which is connected to 
the, they magnetize uh, along the magnetic field lines of the Earth. Great. Um, would you explain at a high level how the antiferromagnetism is different from others? Yes, yeah, so in, in an antiferromagnet, the, the magnetic spins on neighboring atoms are oppositely directed. So um, there's um, uh, Louis Nayel, uh, who actually received the Nobel Prize for this, um, uh, predicted that there was a low energy configuration in, the, in a material where you had alternating magnetic spins in a material. Now, nobody had a tool at the time he predicted this to, in fact, see if he was, his predictions were correct or not. In fact, it's interesting this question was asked because it was my father who had uh, pioneered the area of neutron diffraction who first showed that the theory was in fact correct. He showed from neutron scattering on a, a magnesium, uh, manganese oxide uh, material showed that in fact you could create this alternating magnetic spin state. And so, the, uh, mm -hmm. Uh, that's that's where it is. Wow, amazing. Um, what's the difference between, po this is an easy one hopefully for you, what's the difference between positive and negative magnetism? Okay, so um, if you apply a positive field, so you know which field you're, in, it's up to you to define what is positive and what is negative, obviously, but if you, say, define your, your magnetic field positive in one, some particular direction, then it develops, uh, if the material develops a magnetization that is in the same direction as that field, then you would call that positive magnetization. Similarly, the reverse uh, uh, would be true. Great, um, and you touched on this a, a bit with the refrigerator talk, but how will the intermediate inputs for refrigerators change, and what would you expect to be the amount of those new materials used in a single refrigerator? Um, actually, can you repeat the question again? Sure. How will the intermediate inputs for refrigerators change, and what would you expect to be the amount of those new materials used in a single refrigerator? Um, okay, so the inputs for a magnetic refrigerator would be um, basically uh, you would need uh, power to either move the sample in and out of a magnetic field, or alternatively, turn the magnetic field on and off around it, or move a permanent magnet near the, your refrigerant or away. So that, that, that power would be required. So that would be one input. Um, in order to get the largest entropy changes, people have found that uh, if you go to larger magnetic fields, you'll get larger entropy changes. So that would imply that you would need very, very large fields to get the largest uh, effect. That would mean superconducting magnets, which would require for their own uh, operation uh, significant cooling requirements in order to cool down the, the wires making up that magnet to stay in the superconducting state. So that would be another very big input. The, uh, the most viable direction, I think, is something, in fact, that we uh, mentioned years ago initially, was to think in terms of using permanent magnets. So there's some of these ferromagnets, which are very strong, as the source of magnetic fields, rather than superconducting magnets. And then find materials which have large entropy changes for the permanent magnet fields you can think of uh, achieving. And those are uh, fields on the order of about between one and two tesla you can apply with a permanent magnet. Um, so there the only input would be the motion of the sample in and out. There's a way to create the magnetic fields in a sample and change it from large value to small value using a um, uh, interesting uh, rotating uh, type magnet. Um, I forget the, the name of the designer of this, any rate. Um, and so you very easily can change fields high and low. So the inputs will be much, much less in that case. How much material you'd want? Obviously, the more refrigerant, the more total um, refrigeration capacity there will be. Um, and there will, uh, have, there will be an optimal amount uh, created. Um, uh, the refrigerants do not have to have rare earth elements in them. Uh, the, 
the ones that people have been looking at initially did have large rare amounts of rare earth elements, but there are a new class of materials of nickel, manganese, cobalt, gallium, and I think boron and other elements um, have a very large magnetochloric effects, and of course, none of those are rare earth elements. Great, um, and I still have quite a few questions to go through. Any questions in the room right now? Karen's coming with a microphone for you. Uh, Just hang on. Moment. Wait, wait. Thanks. So the dream of spintronics that people have been bandying around is that you could make a you could make a computer that's based on spin, not on charge. But computers today use a lot of wires in them. And uh, has anyone ever invented a, a wire for spin? Invented a wire with spin. Well, that's a good would, question. They're would you all just good repeat questions. that for okay. the WebEx? The question was, a wire is very effective at moving charge. That is, you can have a, a wire coming out of an outlet, and you can move charge, electrons, from one place in that wire to the next. So you're moving charge. So what is just asked is, is there a way to move spin, that is a magnetic spin, from one end of that wire to the other end of the wire? Um, a lot of people are looking into creating what is called a spin current, exactly. So this is where there's no charge motion, but yet there is a motion of spin from one end of some thing, a wire or something else, to the other end. Um, some people have uh, claimed to have done it. Uh, I think it is still a little controversial as to whether that, those were uh, proper experiments. Um, or proper uh, analysis, uh, but I think that uh, generally people seem to feel this is quite possible and that uh, if uh, they have not been created yet, the, uh, people are getting very, very close to that. And there, of course, there are a lot of advantages of being able to move spin rather than just move charge, and that's why there's, you can have uh, wonderful effects like spin hall effects and uh, uh, other type spin seaback effects and things that are not uh, were not possible beforehand. Um, sort of related to the Spintronics question, someone had asked um, about how that is being explored to replace solid state memories. Is it economically at par? Um, meaning Spintronics memories will be as or cheaper than solid state memories? Right now they're not. Well, actually they are because in fact the fact that you have a multiple gigabit hard disk now is all because of this really the spintronic effect of the giant magneto resistance effect or the subsequently a magnetic tunneling effect. So you have that uh, on your computers now because of it. Uh, obviously those memories are much cheaper. It's getting harder and harder to make high, get higher and higher storage densities using the same tricks that the industry was using up till now. They've come up with some new tricks which look like this will in, in, continue to increase storage densities. And the first ones they come out with, and they in fact have come out with a, a couple so far, um, uh, will be expensive. But then once the processing has been uh, uh, developed properly, then the price will come way down. Great. Um, I still have several WebEx questions left. I know people may need to leave to go to meetings and things. Any other questions in the room at the moment? Otherwise, I'll keep plugging away with WebEx. Okay. I uh, got one here. Oh, do we? Okay. Karen's coming. Just a moment. Uh, effects, uh, are there any negative effects that have been identified? Of uh, oh. nanomagnetism? Yeah. I can't think of any <laughs> <laughs> offhand. Um, no, I, I, I can't think any negative effects of nanomagnetism. I mean, you, you've probably read in the uh, literature, uh, of both uh, scientific as well as non-scientific, that there, there are some perhaps potentially bad effects of making small things, um, but uh, with them being magnetic or not, I don't know of any downside to that. Great. Um, could, okay, someone from 
the PTO has uh, two questions. Is there a difference in observed Faraday effects between nanomagnetic systems and magnetic systems? Was her, her first question. Mm -hmm. Um, in fact, there are uh, uh, effects on the Faraday uh, effect. There's, there are particulate size effects on the Faraday effect of a material. Um, there was a group in Italy a number of years ago who showed that the uh, Faraday effect, um, in fact, could be enhanced if you looked at some particulate material mm -hmm. where the uh, you read, actually, it wasn't so much particular, it was more grain size. As you reduce the grain size, you could actually improve on it. Um, I don't know the details uh, so much beyond that, but indeed, there is, a re there is an effect there. Great. Um, and the second part of her question was, has anyone combined magnetic or nanomagnetic particles with photocatalysts or nanoparticle photocatalysts? And she references um, a patent for... Faraday effects in photochemistry? Well, certainly you can change the, the um, um, photo effects by particle size. Mm -hmm. People have shown this uh, for a long time. Um, there is interest in coupling magnetic and photo effects, um, specifically in applications where you want to use the magnetic characteristic of the particle to either affect some action like, say, hyperthermia. So you want it to be attached to some sort of cell that you want to kill, in this case, a cancer cell. Um, but you would also like some sort of photo uh, signature to tell you that your particle is actually attaching mm -hmm. to these cells. Sure. Um, and so, as a consequence, people would like to develop of particles which would have a combined effect like this. So one to uh, uh, affect the action on the material and the other to tell you that your, your action is, is being uh, delivered to the right things. Great. Um, how does the Peltier, Peltier effect change when applied on a nanoscale? Well, the, the Peltier effect doesn't care whether it's nanoscale or not. Um, the, the, I suppose what is being asked is uh, perhaps the, maybe the relative magnitudes of the Peltier effect when you're working on something small and large. Mm -hmm. Obviously the effects will be smaller for the, uh, the smaller uh, materials. Um, um, the, um, um, I'm not sure what the question was really asking, so I'm not sure what to say further than that. Okay, um, well, let's move on to the next one then. Um, how might this presentation relate to the human brain's functionality? That may be outside of your wheelhouse also. I'm not sure this presentation does, <laughs> except, <laughs> for, except whether you all have, uh, who are on the web and, and here in the audience uh, uh, were able to uh, uh, grasp all the things that I was uh, delivering or not. In that case, there, it does connect to the brain's functionality. <laughs> um, what is the difference between the spin of an electron and its magnetic orientation? Okay, so the, uh, it, in general, the, it's one and the same. So when I, I talk about the magnetic spin on, uh, well, actually, when I'm talking about the magnetic spin on an atom, and this comes about partially because of the, uh, the spins on the electrons around it, but uh, when I talk about the magnetization of a material, I'm talking about the magnetic, total magnetic spin or magnetic moment on that atom. So now they're talking about the magnetic spin been on an electron, mm -hmm. and the difference between that and... It's magnetic orientation. Ah. Um, well, it's magnetic orientation would be in the same direction as the, the, of that electron would be in the same orientation as the Good. spin. That was an easy one for you then. Um, and final question. Um, what written materials would you recommend for further study? Um, there are a lot of um, books which have come out in the, the last, I guess, 10 years what's on... Your, what's your top read for this? 
Um, I'd say look for, for papers of my name on it. Yeah. And <laughs> That's a great answer. <laughs> Only being facetious. Um, I guess um, since much of this is so new, the, probably the scientific literature is, is the best place to, to go to. Great. So uh, citation uh, indexes, mm. um, the um, Kim Abstracts is a great place to go to get uh, information. Great. And for anyone who's interested, I'm sure the librarians either here or at NIST would be happy to get people what they need to learn more. Um, and if there are no other questions in the room, then I think that will end it for today. Thank you, everyone, for staying with us, and thank you for a wonderful presentation. I'll just uh, pa pass uh, and show you a picture of my dad. So oh. there's, there's no substitute to choosing your parentage well. And you can see, I obviously uh, chose my parentage well. Definitely. And for those of you in the audience, I happen to bring my father's Nobel Prize medal. Wow. So if you would like to come up and take a look at it, if you haven't seen this before, by all means do so. Wonderful. Thank you, Thank you so much.